Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you all here again, to see so many people in the flesh. Um, it's been a long time, but we're really glad that you managed to join us tonight. I'm Francesca Oakeman white and I'm the founder of the Beauty Triangle. So October for us at the Beauty Triangle has very much been a celebration of women's wellness. We've had some really powerful conversations about breast cancer awareness, about World Mental Health Day, and most topically, and the reason why we're all here today, for World Menopause Day. Now, our aim with the Beauty Triangle has always been to educate and empower audiences on all aspects of their health and well-being, and always from a holistic standpoint. Um, however, it's also been to connect consumer audiences with some of the best and most authoritative practitioners and wellness experts out there. Which brings me to our amazing lineup of ladies who we have with us tonight. I'm really, really excited to be joined by consultant gynecologist and menopause expert, Ms. Tanya Adib, by bioidentical hormone specialist and GP, Dr. Sahir Rokhad, and by one of the world's leading meditation and lifestyle experts, Dr. Padma Shankar Koram. And they are all here today to answer the questions that so often go unasked when it comes to the menopause. Everything from how to manage the physical symptoms that might hit us as life goes on to how to get our hormones back under control, but also how to navigate the changes that crop up in later life and help us rediscover a sense of self. Um, a few things just before we get started. You've probably all found it, but there is a program on your seats with information on our amazing lineup of ladies. If you'd like us to connect you with anybody that you hear speak tonight, then just leave your details on the form and we will do all the rest. Um, we'll have time for an audience Q&A at the very end. So any burning questions, please save them until the end. I promise you we will have time to answer them. And we also have an amazing goodie bag for you. So please don't leave without it. We've had some incredible brands contribute. We've got Altriant, uh, St. Iris, and then also Oskia and Otto, who are the Mandarin Oriental's amazing skincare partners. So I promise you, you won't want to leave it behind. Um, that's definitely enough from me now. I'm going to hand over to our amazing panelists. They're each going to say a quick hello and introduce themselves, and then we'll get started with the conversation. So Tanya, maybe we can start with you. Hi, evening. So yes, I'm Tanya Adib. I'm a consultant gynecologist. I specialise in the menopause and um, more latterly specialise in vaginal health. So optimising vaginal health and treating dryness, prolapse, stress incontinence with treatments such as laser, radiofrequency, uh, PRP um, to help women's vaginal health. Amazing. A lady with a solution. Uh, Dr. Rokhead. Hi, I'm Sahar Rokhead. I'm a GP and I mainly see uh, women for hormone issues, uh, including menopause, but also younger women in perimenopause or people having period problems. Um, I do a lot of integrative medicine, so I'm trying to look at health holistically. Uh, so I also do look at things like vitamins, minerals, supplements, stress hormones and gut health, because I think that uh, that's how the body works. We look at all areas together to get optimum health. And over to you, Padma. Hi, my name is Padma. And I want to thank Mandarin Oriental for allowing me to be the panel because I'm also a, a visiting consultant here. So thank you, Mandarin, for allowing me to be here today. I also am like Sahar in the sense I'm integrated, but mine is more on the holistic side of mind, body, and soul because I really do believe that we are not just one hump, one sum of people. What affects in our work life, affects in our personal life, what affects in our personal life can affect us in our emotional life. So I deal with everything that comes from inside out and outside in both ways. It helps bring peace, calm, happiness and joy. That's such a nice summary. Thank you, Padma. And such an amazing holistic lineup we have tonight. So I'm super excited. Um, Tanya, let's start with you. So as a gynecologist, you obviously see women for all sorts of reasons coming to your door. But would you say the menopause is something that a lot of people come to you for? Or is it one of those conversations that comes about once they're there chatting about other you know, issues? So a lot of women will come to me and say, I think I've got symptoms of the menopause. I'm you know, of that age. The periods are dwindling um, and I'm really struggling with these symptoms, which I'm pretty sure are part of the menopause. And then I also see women who are maybe in their late 30s, early 40s, who are still having periods, mm -hmm. but are suffering from symptoms such as anxiety, really low mood, insomnia, 
um, agitation, which can also be um, hormonally related mm. um, and, you know, hormone balancing. So really seeing that really full spectrum. Help them. Mm. Yeah. And, and when it comes to, to helping those women, I suppose, how can we encourage them first and foremost to not hesitate when it comes to sort of talking about the menopause first and foremost? How can we get them to actually come to your door and, and, and not be sort of scared, I suppose, to start these conversations? I think it's about education and getting the message out there that, mm. you know, this is not a treatment, this is a, a rebalancing. We're just rebalancing the hormones and um, replacing what the body is no longer producing as well as it used to. Mm. Um, so it's HRT is not about uh, a, a prescription. It's about giving bioidentical hormones and rebalancing estrogen, progesterone, testosterone often as mm. well. Um, and just helping women feel balanced again. Yeah, exactly. I feel like balance is a word that so often sort of comes up when we talk about sort of anything to do with hormonal um, attributes. I mean, what, what symptoms would you say are causing the most anxiety with the women that come to see you for, for issues relating to the menopause? So they'll often tell me about hot flushes, sweats, um, low mood, mood swings. Um, they'll often tell me that their partners have noticed that you know, they have really terrible mood swings. Mm. Um, I see a lot of women who are in really high powered jobs who can't sleep and yeah. can't focus on their work. They've got this terrible brain fog. They can't concentrate. They forget everything. Mm. And we in know that it's a huge, huge oh, process. And we know that about 25% of women actually quit their jobs because of symptoms of the menopause. I read this recently, one in four women, it's, it's terrifying. Shocking. Yeah, it's shocking. So, and it's so easily treated. Mm. So they often come to me with, you know, as a last ditch, I'm desperate, I really need some help. Mm. You know, I'm about to quit my job. And, it, and it's such a shame. I often think it's so cruel that actually at a stage of a woman's life when she's often feeling so in control and powerful and at the peak of her career and, you know, maybe she has her family and, and everything else set up that this can be the one thing that then... <sighs> Um, drags her down again. Exactly. And women pass over promotions because they just don't feel great and they don't feel able to take on that work. Mm. Do, you, do you often feel that a lot of women that have come to see you have previously been told, you know, this is just what happens, deal with it, get on with it and, and stop complaining, essentially? Um, yes. I mean, I think there's a lot of angst around the menopause. You know, mm. just over a century ago, women were only living up, up, up until the menopause. So yeah, that's it's so really true. only recently that the menopause has become such a thing that we are living into our late 80s and 90s. Mm. Um, so potentially living half our lives in the menopause. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, it really affects um, the quality of women's lives. It's exactly it. That's what I was going to say to you. I think so much of what you do is about helping the women to find that quality of life again, which, you know, she should have. And actually, exactly as you've just said, we are living for longer and we're achieving yeah. so much more at a later stage of life. So it shouldn't be something that is holding us back. And we're staying fitter for longer as well. Yeah. You know, women are active and mm. working in their 70s and their 80s. Agreed. And they should feel fantastic mm. and be able to sleep well and feel great during the day and be able to le lead a normal life. Yeah. Just because they're getting older doesn't mean that they should be suffering. Mm. And, and you also see a lot of women, don't you, who are perhaps going through treatment for or recovering from things like breast cancer, a lot of other women who, for whatever reason, can't have hormonal replacement therapy because of other conditions that they might have. So what are the treatments that you can then offer those women if it's not hormonally based? So having worked at the Breast Cancer Haven um, and being a trustee for the Haven, I got to speak to a lot of women who've had breast cancer and the overarching problem for them is vaginal dryness mm. and pain. Um, and even if they're not sexually active, vaginal dryness can cause itching, discomfort, needing to go to the toilet more often, mm. needing to go to the toilet at night. Um, and, you know, for these women, vaginal treatments are especially important mm. to help them with their self-confidence, gain their femininity back. That and often are, are these been symptoms of the menopause, are these sort of urinary tract infections that have been triggered by it or are they something else entirely? So it's usually due to a decrease in estrogen. Right. So this is where the laser comes in mm. um, so well that it 
regenerates the collagen, um, it improves lubrication, it mm -hmm. thickens the skin of the vagina, um, and it really helps with symptoms, and it's non-hormonal and safe. So how does this laser work? It's sort of an, an internal device, is it? It's a probe that's inserted in the vagina, mm -hmm. um, and it shoots out tiny little jets of carbon dioxide. We call it a laser, but it's... You know, it's not a laser beam. We're not burning the vagina. It's tiny little jets of carbon dioxide, 0.2 millimeters into the skin. It's a very superficial mm. treatment. But Is there any sensation for the woman who's having it done? A little bit of a vibration. Oh, wow. That's, That's probably it. quite nice. The vagina has no pain fibers, so the women don't feel it as pain. That's so interesting. Yeah. Oh, because that obviously goes back to childbirth. For childbirth, yeah. How exactly. interesting. We've just evolved to have no pain receptors down there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and how long does that... So that's the... What's the name of this laser? So I use the Mona Lisa Touch laser. Okay. That's the laser that has the most scientific evidence mm -hmm. um, associated with it. There are lots of lasers out there, yeah. but they're not all equal and they're not all as effective as um, the other. So I use the Mona Lisa Touch laser. It's three treatments at four to six weekly intervals initially, right. and then annual top-up treatments, Great. roughly. And how long does it take the woman uh, to, who's having this Mona Lisa Touch to then experience sort of a benefit in, in her, or, or sort of to have those symptoms lessen somewhat? It depends on her starting point. So mm. some women find a benefit after about two weeks, Others don't find a benefit after until after the third treatment. Mm. So it's quite variable. It really depends on the starting point. And it's so interesting because this is obviously a very non-surgical um, option, whereas I suppose previously in mainstream healthcare, we're either looking at the, the sort of surgical end, aren't we? Or we're looking at the sort of initial physiotherapy and things like that. Yeah, so vaginas we give, um, we use topical estrogen cream, which a lot of women either don't like or don't want or mm. are scared of using. Um, so treatments like the laser are really effective, um, alternative. Yeah. Um, so laser is only one of them for things like prolapse and stress incontinence, mm -hmm. um, which is more usual in women who've had children vaginally, um, and you know, with age and the menopause, then the tissues can become, uh, lax and weak and the pelvic floor can, um, sink a little bit. So mm -hmm. for these women, I tend to go for radiofrequency. Okay. Which, and that's another probe, is it? It's another probe mm -hmm. and it causes a warming effect um, in the vagina mm -hmm. and it regenerates both the collagen and the elastin. And so it creates more of a tightening effect. Oh, okay. And so it's, it's more effective for symptoms such as incontinence, mm. um, urgency and prolapse. And again, it's a really great non-surgical option yeah. between pelvic floor physiotherapy, which anyway, we should all be doing, um, and surgery. I mean, when you say we should all be doing the, the physiotherapy, how, how often should we be doing it? When should we be doing it? It's often something that you only start to think about after having children, but actually, mm. is it something we should really be thinking about throughout the duration of our lives? Well, we should all be doing pelvic floor exercises on most days, do we? No, nobody does. No, we always forget. Um, it's really difficult to maintain. You have to find a time when you can just focus on like sat in the car or in the shower or something. <laughs> exactly. You, you have to, to do it. You have to associate it with something else, yeah. like brushing your teeth or something. But yeah, you know, you have to stack it on top of an existing habit, don't you? So that exactly. it actually becomes routine. Exactly. Um, and you yeah. offer some really innovative sort of treatments, products, sort of along the lines of injectables as well when it comes to vaginal health, don't you? So I use platelet-rich plasma. Mm -hmm. um, Which is the, the sort of platelets spun out from the blood because they're full of growth factors and amazing things to regenerate. Exactly, exactly. And if you inject them just on the front part of the vagina, just under the urethra, mm. it can help um, with incontinence. Amazing. Because it causes a bulking effect around the So the tissue's opening. actually sort of volumized, do yeah, they? Exactly, exactly. Oh. So, so it physically sort of stops the, the incontinence due to having sort of swollen in volume so much. And a regeneration locally just there of the collagen. Yeah. And it helps the urethra close. And, and what about for sort of aesthetic reasons? Can you use dermal fillers um, in the vagina anyway just to make things look nicer, make them look how they once used to be? 
Yeah, so I use hyaluronic acid in the vagina and you can use that as a moisturizer instead of the laser. Right. So you don't if you don't want the laser, the um HA filler HA injections are a, a very good alternative. Mm. Um the labia majora on the outside, so on the vulva, starts to lose volume and you're probably mid twenties. Mid twenties, really? Absolutely. When your fibroblasts all shut down. I don't know why, particularly in that part of the body, but they, you know, you do often really lose the volume quite early on. And that can also cause discomfort on sitting or riding a bicycle or horse riding. Also, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, and in sex as well, probably, I'm sure. Exactly. So, for these women, I use um, slightly heavier dermal filler, mm. which can just restore the volume um, and also make the inner labia less obvious. Because so, you sort of rebalance the exactly, aesthetic of the whole area. Exactly. exactly. So exactly. some women come to me saying, you know, they want a labiaplasty, mm. but actually what they need is volume, um, you know, refilling, and that can then hide the labia really nicely. It's so interesting because we know that we lose collagen in our faces and our skin and our bodies, but I think we never, fo- you know, remember about our vaginas, do we? But yeah. we, we probably need to be more focused on that. Yeah. And it can really affect your self-esteem and femininity, femininity if mm. things don't feel function well down there yeah 100 percent. and whether you want to have sex and whether you want to sort of be intimate with your partner and and all of these other things you must see it causing if it goes untreated so many sort of emotional issues further down the line between couples as well i imagine absolutely has a huge effect Mm. on couples yeah and i mean i find that we so often speak about you know mental health and gut health and skin health but you know you touched on it earlier we never really speak about vaginal health Um, why do you think as a a gynecologist it's so important that we start having these conversations and and make that more a part of our narrative? Because I think vaginal health is especially affected after the menopause. We know that probably 70 to 80 percent of women after the menopause will encounter vaginal dryness Mm. and it only gets worse in time if left untreated. Um, And there are so many different options now. Equally, prolapse, urinary incontinence, that also worsens with age um, without Mm. intervention. Mm. And actually, vaginal health is so important to how you feel about yourself. You know, if you have to plan your day around needing to go to the toilet every two minutes, Mm, um, not being able to drink, it really is life limiting. Um, And, you know, like I said, the age of the menopause has remained unchanged over the centuries mm. but we are it's just growing that we're, older we're continuing um so we need to be much more proactive about staying healthy mm. and well um into our later years no it's so true and and with these women who are menopausal who you are treating with all of these various sort of amazing uh, lasers and radio frequency and fillers and things do you see from your perspective like a, a tangible quality of life difference for them do they do they uh, change their behaviours? To, does it make them happier? What do they say to you when they when they come back after their course of treatment? Oh, it incredibly in- increases their quality of life. You know, women who have incontinence who then come back to me and say, I'm completely dry now. I don't even have to wear any pads. Yeah. Um, or, you know, my sex life is much better. And my relationship with my partner is much better mm-hmm. uh, or I no longer have pain. The vagina is no longer dry. It has a huge improvement in their overall quality of life Mm. um, and how they live their lives. Yeah, I I can imagine. Every woman needs to have a happy vagina. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to quote you on that for something. That'll be my next future. Um, That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Tanya. Really eye-opening and I think really helpful probably for everyone who's who's sat here as well. Um, Dr. Sahir, over to our amazing bioidentical hormone expert. Um, I mean, we touched on the subject of menopause and why we talk about it and why we don't. But what are your thoughts? Do you think as a subject matter, the menopause is becoming less stigmatized or do we still have a way to go? I think it's definitely becoming less stigmatized, which is great. There's documentaries on the BBC, Channel 4, celebrities Mm -hmm. are talking about it more. And I think that's really important and encouraging for people to know that, okay, this isn't something you should be shy about talking about. It's a normal part of a woman's life mm. um, and we, we have to embrace it and talk about it and and just be more open about it as well. And I think that's mm. very, very important. Do you think it will ever become something that we celebrate? You know, I feel like in, in some cultures, you know, certain stages of a woman's life, you know, yeah. it, it is cause for celebration. But do we what do we have to do, I suppose, to get to that point? 
So I think we have to change our perspective on how we see menopause mm. and see it as we're entering a new part of life and look at the advantages. And I think one of the reasons there hasn't been advantages in the past is because hormone replacement therapy has been discouraged. So mm. people don't feel good. They lose their confidence. They can feel not like themselves anymore. So they're like, well, what am I celebrating now? I feel like I've lost a part of myself. Exactly. But with good hormone replacement therapy, can enter this new phase of life and feel happy and confident about it. Mm, exactly. It, it is reframing that narrative for a lot of women, isn't mm. it? What percentage of the women who come to see you would you say are there for menopause-related reasons? Um, so I'd say that obviously menopause care is a lot better these days from your GP, which is great news. Um, but I, the majority of my work is still around the menopause. I'd say at least 60% of the women I see are in menopause. And I, I do see women who come in with period problems and things as well, but a huge number of people I will see are in perimenopause. Um, because I think we kind of know as, as doctors, I still do some NHS work. Uh, so as GP, GPs kind of know what they're doing with the menopause now, which is great news. But the perimenopause is still a bit of this unknown. Well, what am I meant to be doing? Because this woman's still having periods, but she's feeling terrible. So can I give her hormone replacement therapy? And that's a lot of the people I see these days because sometimes they're told to wait until their periods stop. And they're like, well, that could be years. What am I meant to do until yeah, then? Exactly. Just feel terrible. Who, who so, tells them that? To um, wait some some years. doctors, really? some GPs do. Because again, GPs, when I did GP training, which was like 2009 to 2011, the message was, don't give them HRT. And if they want HRT, basically tell them they're going to get breast cancer and like on their head be it, right? So exactly. Can, and that's still the thing that people will connect with yeah, if they have a fear of the HRT. Definitely. So people are like, you know, that's now evolved, which is great. And GPs aren't telling people that anymore, which is fantastic news. So, but it's still very new to a lot of GPs and they're still learning and finding out more about what to do. And there's great training these days for GPs in menopause and things as well. But, you know, it's still evolving. So I think that's why why that part, maybe the perimenopause, still isn't quite covered yet. And so can we delve a bit deeper into perimenopause? Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, menopause for a long time, everyone has known what, what that stands for, what happens. What, what specifically is happening when we enter perimenopause and, and when is it happening? So perimenopause can be up to five to ten years before actual menopause for some women. And it's when there are hormonal changes. So you're often still having a period but it could be more irregular. So either there are bigger gaps in between or you're missing every other one or for some women, they're just really frequent and they're just bleeding all the time. And there's no, not necessarily a pattern to it. So that can be difficult to manage because for the person who's experiencing it, they can't predict what's happening. Am I having my period? Am I not having my period? It comes out of the blue. Mm. It's heavy. It's light. It's just spotting. I thought it was over. Then it came back. So it can be difficult to manage without guidance. And quite disruptive as well. Oh, very, If you think yeah. life is going in one direction and then suddenly it's, it's back again yeah. or it's you know drops sure. off if you're used to a monthly period and then all of a sudden you don't know when you're bleeding and and when you're not then it can be extremely disruptive and and what sort of um age is is there an average age for perimenopause now does is it fluctuating um i generally say it's from the late 40s on but i do see women younger and i also see women in their early 50s who are still in the perimenopause and are not quite in that menopausal time yet, but generally late 40s on. And, and so when they do come in to see you and they suspect they're perimenopausal or even menopausal, what are the symptoms that are bringing them to your door? Is it more the physical or is it more the emotional, the anxiety, the sleeplessness, or all, all the things that Tanya mentioned? So it can be just these really disruptive periods, you know, just bleeding all the time is not pleasant for anyone. And the other symptoms that go along with it, you know, feeling tired or heavier or being in pain or bloated. Mm. Um, but most of the people come to see me mainly because the emotional and mood symptoms are the most disruptive. A lot of people say to me, I could just cope if I was if I was only hot now and again. That I could probably cope with. It's the fact that I'm not sleeping, I'm moody, I'm irrational, their words, not mine. You know, I know mm. I'm overreacting to things in a way that I wasn't before. It's affecting my job. I, you know, a lot of women in their 50s still have young kids and they find it's affecting their child rearing as well. That's so, interesting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more snappy. I'm not as patient. I know yeah. I'm being unreasonable, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's out of my control. I think and, that's so true. It's yeah. when it impacts upon other people and you yeah. feel that it's starting to have a negative effect on others around mm. you. Probably when it's just yourself, you can deal with it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah for sure. I think that's 
it's really difficult. You know, if it was just you and then, you know, sometimes I'm a bit more snappy with my partner, but, you know, I'm not that bothered about that. But when you yeah. when they're like, it's really affecting my children and I know it's me, it's not them, it's me. So I need to come and get something done. So that's one of the reasons that people come in. And I bet, you know, for a huge number of women as well, it's that loss of confidence as well that sort of goes hand in hand with a lot of the changes that are going on. Definitely. At this stage of life. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I had a woman say to me quite recently, I look in the mirror and I don't recognise that person anymore. I see the way I behave, or, you know, retrospectively reflecting on it, and I don't know who I am anymore, why I'm behaving this way. Mm. And it's that lack of control. So it's all about, you know, coming back, taking control of your health and your well-being and doing something for yourself to benefit yourself and the people around you. And speaking of sort of not looking looking in the mirror and not recognising yourself, I mean, that sort of trips into so many of the physical symptoms. You know, you must see women with skin complaints, um, with sort of weight gain. We always talk about the hormonal belt, like the, the midsection suddenly becomes very difficult to lose weight from, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And also the motivation goes perhaps to do things because you're so tired all the time. You have low energy, so it's harder to exercise, to make good dietary choices, um, you know, to take care of yourself in a way you would have before. Mm. So all these things then, then then impact how you're feeling. Exactly. It's sort of like a snowballing effect. Yeah. Um, and, and you're obviously a huge believer in the power of bioidentical hormones. Yeah. So can you tell us firstly, what, what's the difference between the bioidentical hormones and the body identical hormones? And also what role did they then play in helping us to manage you know, the symptoms you just mentioned? Sure. So both bioidentical hormones and body identical hormones are hormones that have, have the same chemical structure that your own body is making or was making previously. So your body can metabolize them better. The body identical hormones, the terms given for the hormones made by a drug company that have the same chemical structure as the ones your body was or is making. And the bioidentical hormones are generally custom. <coughs> so both are very good and both work really well. But for some people, what's available from a drug company doesn't suit them in some way, either the dosing or the form. Um, so, for example, there are a couple of estrogen gels, there's patches and there's one testosterone, um, progesterone tablet. Um, and some people need different forms of these um, hormones. And also testosterone is very important for women as well. And generally, they have to be used in a, in a man's form, really, a lot of the time. So sometimes that needs to be custom made in a woman's dose as well. So, so it comes down to them being more bespoke. Is that correct with a bioidentical? Yeah. Not so to say that be... one is better or the other. Sure. But... Yeah, I wouldn't say one's better than the other, but yeah. some people need something a bit more tailored. Um, and it's good to give people options. I think it's important for women to have options. Mm, no, it's so true. Um, and is there any value in getting your hormones checked before you even get to this stage where you might be perimenopausal or menopausal? Is it helpful for us to have a baseline understanding of our hormones in any way? So you're asking someone slightly biased. But <laughs> yes, I would say so. And it's something I talk about with my girlfriends all the time as well. Because if you know what your hormones are doing when you feel good then you have something to go off when you're not feeling as good and we can see what the changes are. Sometimes I, I look at hormone levels and, and to me, I think, well, on paper, these levels look really good, but I don't know what was going on for that woman five years ago or 10 years ago per se. Mm. Um, so I think having a good baseline and, and just being aware of what's going on in your body from an early stage I think that's always beneficial because quite often as a younger woman, you can have different changes, but you put it down to stress or your job. And, and perhaps there was a hormone imbalance going on then that wasn't picked up on. So I, I do see a lot of women in their 30s and 40s now who are more aware of this. And these are things we look at. And it's so it's so cool because there are now so many sort of uh, techie like apps and things that yeah. help you track these things. You know, your cycle, your periods, your your mood imbalances, yeah. how you're feeling physically. So I suppose technology is trying to to help us sort of stay in control and, and gain that body awareness that you said. Yeah, and no, that's just how far we've come as well. You know, we'd never talk about periods before. You'd never tell anyone if you were premenstrual. You wouldn't mm -hmm. talk about your heavy flow or things like that. It's like, <laughs> just don't talk about any of these things. It's all embarrassing. Because now we're a lot more open. You know, we can monitor things on apps. We can get to know our bodies better and track mm -hmm. our cycles. And I think it's very empowering, actually, for women these days. 
because these are things we can do and be they can be part of our everyday lives now. I think knowledge is always power, isn't it? Yeah, and, for and there's sure. something very satisfying about understanding the, the rhythms and, and the patterns that your body is going through. You know, yeah. it happens with every sort of cycle in our body. It all has its own rhythm and it's it's sort of amazing to sort of see how it all fits and works together. Um, for the women who do come to see you then for the bioidentical hormones or BHRT, what's their first step into starting that journey? What what do you how do you start them? So we normally have a consultation where we discuss the symptoms, uh, what's affecting them, what their um, goals are, you know, what they want to achieve. We talk about any negatives they've heard about hormones so we can just clarify things and just start from, um, you know, a place of of empowered knowledge. Um, If a woman hasn't had a period for a long time, I generally don't do blood tests straight away because privately blood tests are expensive. We need to think about these things in terms of considerations of of treatment and outcomes. You know, there's no point doing something unless it's going to be cost effective and something we can continue. I think that's very important to address in private medicine. Um, But then if a woman is having periods or having irregular periods, I do often do testing. We look at the results together. We look at what hormones I think is beneficial. It's always a two-way discussion, though. It's not Mm. me going, right, just take this stuff and off you go. It's like, what do you, you know, this is what I think. What do you think based on what I've said? Does this sound like it's sitting well for you? Is this something you were thinking of? Were there other things? And then look at the bigger picture as well. So, you know, just taking a bit of hormone cream and rubbing it into your arm every day isn't necessarily going to do everything. What's going on in your life? You know, what are your stresses? How are you managing your nutrition, your exercise, your sleep, um, you know, your relationships in your life? You know, what other things should we be looking at? Are there supplements needed? Is there other testing like gut health that could be of benefit? Um, And just trying to look at things from a holistic way, but also Mm -hmm. to not overwhelm the person in front of me because if they're not feeling great, I don't want to give people like 50 things to do. And I just know I'm not going to see them again. So we'll look at maybe three or four things we can do, get someone feeling a bit better. And then at our next appointment in two to three months, go, how can we build on this? So it's a evolving relationship over time. But definitely a good idea to start with the baby steps because you're oh, right, it's, yeah. it's, it's very overwhelming as well if it's a whole new sort of um, part of, of life for you as well, I imagine. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, to treating patients, I mean, you just mentioned you work in a very holistic manner. So what is the importance of, for example, getting our gut health into its peak? Or I suppose uh, you, you do a lot of work with managing stress, like you mentioned, ensuring that our adrenals, our cortisol, that all of that is balanced. How does that then help women to manage the menopause going, going forward? So if there's another imbalance in the body, I often find that taking the hormones alone isn't enough to get them feeling good. Or they might feel temporarily better for three to six months, and then other symptoms start creeping in again. So I think it's important to look at things holistically, but not overwhelm the person in front of me. So if I if I think two things are equal, so I'm like, I think you're in menopause, but I also think there's a gut issue here, and we should probably look at the things together. I, I will say that. But if I'm like, maybe we can get you feeling a bit better first with your hormones, and then in a couple of months' time, we can then focus in on the gut health, because you'll be more motivated to do things once you're feeling a bit better. Because... If you're feeling quite low and then I'm telling you to change up your diet and start exercising, it's too much to do, really. Whereas if I can get you feeling a bit better, first of all, then you're going to be more inclined to do some of the other things that I mentioned. So um, I think it's about looking at what the person in front of me also wants and can manage because people have busy lives, families, jobs, um, other outside pressures. And it's all about what can we do now that's that you can cope with, because I'm not here to make your life more difficult. I'm here to try and help you. Um, I know other people who've, who've maybe seen other practitioners in the past and they've come away with 40 supplements. So they've taken none of them because they haven't known which ones to take and which ones are important and which ones aren't. So I'm like, okay, how many supplements do you realistically think you can take? And it might be three. And then I'm like, okay, I've got to just work with three here. Um, but we'll start with three and we can build on it over time. So I think it's about meeting the person where they are because it's a difficult stage of life so if I can help them in that sense and then we build a relationship and some trust then we can evolve that over time 
And, and how long do these relationships last that you have with the menopausal women who come to see you? Is, is, it, uh, is it something that goes on for years and years? Do you have regular check-in points with them? What, what does it look like? So I started um, in this field in 2014, and I'm still seeing some of the patients I saw in 2014 now, which is lovely for me. It's always really fulfilling to build that relationship with someone over time and see how their lives change and evolve. And um, yeah, it's really satisfying. Um, probably though, the, the sort of average relationship I have with a patient is around two to three years for mm. a variety of different reasons. Um, but yeah, I do, you know, I'm honest about that. And I'm like, it's normally around two, two to three years to help them through that difficult stage of their life. And sometimes they go back to their GP who helps manage their menopause, or sometimes they just go down a different uh, route of treatment. I think sometimes it's about time and place, isn't it? You know, you're not always the right fit for everyone at every stage of life, just like our hormones change, you know, what they need from their practitioner changes. And it sounds like hopefully you just empower them enough and put them back in control that they can then move ahead and and make those sort of decisions themselves as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much to hear. That was super interesting. Um, And yeah, thank you for, for sharing all of that with us. Um, On to our final speaker, Dr. Padma. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I mean, you obviously work with women as well, Padma, from all sorts of walks of life and you address everything from um, personal growth to emotional well-being to to professional well-being as well. But how how do you see the menopause having an impact on those women who who are there to sort of see you for, for some guidance? I'm going to start off by saying I'm menopausal right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so which is anybody else is I can tell you from personal experience how yeah. it works and I can go into my clients as well. So I'm very compassionate right now with anybody who else who comes with that problem. Which is amazing. Because it is really amazing because, you know, when I have clients who come in to say I'm going through a mess, I've just had a fight with my boyfriend or partner or husband or my child, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, you look at it from different angles, but now that I'm also menopausal, I can see, like, oh my God. Yes. You know, I was wanting to be kind to my little son who's just come out of university, but what is this? Your bag and his smelly shoes out there. <laughs> and then you realize anybody else can do that. <laughs> and then you realize it's not me. Yeah. So there's a whole lot like what, you know, Pam has mentioned here. So I would actually walk them through different stages of where they are. Mm. But the underlying thing, I think, for all of us as women is lack of control. I think that's what we feel very, very overwhelmed by. Mm. We think, oh, my God, I thought I I could multitask. Oh, my God, I thought I was slim. Oh, my God, I thought I could run a mile. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm. We tend to sort of feel we've lost that control of... Mm the original who we think we are. And that part of ourselves, that, that sense of, of ourselves. Exactly. So then I think, um, if other people can be part of this journey with me at this moment, you become self-conscious. Yes. You become very self-conscious thinking, oh my God, my jeans don't fit me anymore. You know, yeah. I can't sit like I used to sit before. It doesn't matter what it is. So that's when I really work with people is when they start getting so self-conscious. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Do you know what I mean? If you're, mm-hmm. going, if you're a working woman, you're going into a meeting and you think, oh, I don't feel that great today. My hair is not, you know, my blow dry isn't working out like before. It's getting dry. Or, it's true though, because when you go menopausal, your hair changes mm. or... You feel, I can't wear those jeans. I thought I could. I mean, last week I wore it, but this week what's happened. Mm. Um, I know, so here we're saying sometimes you just don't recognize yourself in the mirror after correct. a while. So that's that's the journey I take them to sort of sit with them and say, okay, where are you right now? Where would you like to be? And then bite-sized chunks. Yeah, very, very smart. And actually, I think, you know, hormones aside, we've all been through such an upheaval anyway in the past two years almost now with the pandemic. And I'm sure our, our stress levels and our cortisol levels are all at an all-time high. So I, I guess do you, from your experience, do you see that also impacting on menopause? Like we've all lost a bit of perspective. Totally. What's happened in the, in the pandemic, you know, again, a lot of us today are, have this pressure of looking our best. Mm. It's one thing for women to feel like a goddess because I talk to everyone and I say, you're a goddess. You know, <laughs> you're all goddesses, which is true. I really believe that. I really believe that. I come from a culture as we get older, you're respected more, mm. um, more not for your just your outer beauty, but for your inner beauty. Because as you get older, you are wiser. So people would go and say, "Oh my God, what did you do?" That's changed now. It's only about external beauty. Mm. So you know you have the pressure. 
So what's happened is people couldn't go to the doctors for their Botox. People couldn't go to locations for their facials. People couldn't go to different places to look, to maintain ourselves. So the pressure and also conscious, and I think we feel more conscious about, I can't get hold of this, I can't get hold of that. Exactly. So that, that stress plus family stress, plus work stress, plus lack of money or lack of whatever, makes them go hormonal faster is what mm. I've noticed. Very fast, they rapidly decline. Mm. And also during the pandemic, I think all of us went through the stress of I can't travel, I can't go here. I personally lost uh, my husband, I, I lost my mum, I lost my brother-in-law, I lost my sister. So for me, the right. last year, I'm going back to me again just to show it can really take a knock. Maybe that's why I went menopausal so suddenly. Yeah, exactly. So the stress really can, can get to you. It really can. And yes. it's so interesting to see to. how it sort of impacts us as well. I mean, we all say stress is, is going to be the biggest killer. Um, yes. And I think you've just touched upon it as well. You know, it, it can trigger all these things in our bodies Absolutely. that who, who knew that was going to happen. So the mind, I'm going back to the mind, the mind controls the body is where I come from, literally. So the mind tells the body and then the body reacts to it. Yeah, exactly. So and then, you know, menopause and everything that comes with it. But, but it is all connected, mind, body, you know, how we feel internally, what we project externally. And um, what, what is the first step then for these women who you find yourself sort of uh, speaking with, who maybe are menopausal, maybe they're just stressed? How, how do you sort of get them onto their journey? So again, as I said earlier, when we started out, I go into the realm of mind, body, soul. Soul does not have to be religious. Soul or spirit, as I call it, is our inner strength, mm. is how we feel about ourselves, the confidence we exude within ourselves. You know, you look in the mirror and you say, I'm, I'm great. You know, I feel wonderful. And it's quite rare for us to feel that today, right? We always think, oh my God, maybe I should wear a different blouse. I'm, I'm not We're sure all our shoes. own worst enemies as yeah. well. It's so easy to find faults with ourselves. Correct. So my first journey with people is, what's really bothering you? Mm. And then I go back into the root cause. That's for me the most important because the mm. mind, we were just talking about earlier, mm. is our own monkey. It's a monkey mind. It doesn't stay exactly. still. It you just can't goes trust off. anything. It's time. It just goes you. off. I mean, you think yeah. you want to buy the space cream, I look great. And then you think, oh my God, last time I brought that, I had a zip. And then you just go, oh, I met this man and he said something. I met my son. You just <laughs> take off on a journey. Yeah. And then you lose control of yourself. Mm. So my first journey is asking them, finding out, What's really going on in your life? So emotional, 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 mental, mental, mental. Mm. I really believe when you're mentally and emotionally strong, nothing can touch us. We are stunningly beautiful when we control that. Agreed. It, it is about sort of reframing again what, what our mind is giving us in terms of information. And our body actually joins our mind in getting better. Yeah. You know, it really gets better when we feel emotionally and it's mentally so strong. True. You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, 200 kilos, but you feel fabulous yeah people think you're fabulous because mm. you believe and you radiate fabulous. that energy and yeah. it's, it's contagious I mean, have you have noticed that right and then somebody could be absolutely stunning but they walk around thinking i shouldn't be alive yeah and then you all look at them and say they're nothing yeah. so you know that mental strength is what i, I say and that's ultimately what's going to carry us through as well isn't it that yeah, because it strength. Helps relationships families work you could be the boss of your company but, you know, again, going menopausal, you know, you could come in wearing a lovely shirt, but you could be sweating and you think, oh, my God, I'm yeah. losing it. So, you know, it's all the itty-bitty things, but it's not itty-bitty. Right? When it stacks up, stacks up, stacks up, mm -hmm. you just sort of say, I give up. I'm so stressed. Mm. And, and what are these questions like? Are they, are they very in-depth, very descriptive, or are they sort of quite simple and just sort of giving you a framework of the patient who's in front early, of you? I start simple, mm. but I, I go into every area of a person's life. Obviously... The more I use the word naked, the more naked we are, mm. the more honest we are, the faster we can reach. So I would ask them about their personal life, about their physical life, about their emotional life, about their mental life, their spiritual life, about their financial life. But, you know, nothing which is going to make them feel intimidated or saying, I don't want to talk this. That's fine. Mm. We start where you want to start. We finish where you want to finish. We do as much as you can. We do as, as, as little as you need. Mm. But my interest is you walk out feeling like you're a goddess. That's the key. That because is a very nice way to feel. Because you really are. You know, we really are as women. Yeah, exactly. I, I completely agree. And um, you, you have so many amazing techniques that you use. You're an expert in meditation and you use crystals and um, house cleansing, you mentioned to me earlier. How do you go about choosing the right approach for, for the woman who sat in front of you when you've got so many tools at your disposal? Um, 
what I do is, again, I look at the person, where they are, what suits them, and what they believe in as well. Mm, that's so true. Uh, my biggest joy is seeing people in joy. Yes. That's it. So if you feel dressing well brings you joy, let's work on that. Mm. But we go back into the physical form, having great skin, etc. So I work on things like that. Some people might, it's all about energy, isn't it? When you walk into a room, you want to feel positive. Mm. You look at some people, you think, I don't want to be sitting next to this person. Or you look at some person, that I want to be next to them. So it's all about energy. So I work with the energy. They say, I, I go home, but I don't like going home. My house feels like really... I feel tired when I go home. Then a house cleanse really helps because you change the energy of the house. So it's crystal. Because it's sometimes what you're surrounded by as well, isn't it? Sort of your immediate surroundings. Absolutely. So again, by going back to crystals or chakras, I work with chakras a lot. That's my speciality. And meditation is my speciality. Mm. But there's a thousand different meditations. that Exactly. And again, you have to find the right one for the right right client, don't you? Because what works for me? Me might not work for you and vice versa. We are wonderfully different people. That's our beauty. Yeah, exactly. We, have, we are unique individuals. So mm-hmm. we need to work with that uniqueness that you have. So some people would need crystal. Some people would need mainstream. I mm-hmm. work with mainstream as well. So it's about being integrated and embracing everything. It it's sounds not- amazing because you've got such an amazing sort of breadth of, of tools to draw on. Yeah. I've been lucky. I was born into the system. And I can go back for 2,000 years in Ayurveda and all the kind of things. And I've also been blessed that I, I made it a point to go to, the, to America and to all the different locations to study. Yes. And I've also been blessed that I've lived in different countries. I've lived, I mean, obviously, it gives you such a great perspective. I've lived in the Middle East. I've lived in Japan. I've lived in the States. You know, I've just lived in many places. Yeah. So you understand cultures and then you sort of work with people where they are, what they need. Mm. And, and that's so important, as you say, because all the patients, that, all the clients that you were saying are bespoke and they'll all come from different backgrounds and cultures. So, And where they are then, you know, you could have had a great life last year, but suddenly things can get taken off your hand and then you don't know, what's happened to my life now? Yeah, exactly. Or you could have nothing last year, you could have so much this year. Whatever causes all well, we remove the all well and bring you back to balance. It's all about balance. Yeah, a feeling, the, the feeling of overwhelm is actually something that I feel so many people are experiencing mm-hmm. right now and it it creeps in, 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 you know, regardless of what we do, doesn't it? And it's it can be very debilitating. Do, do you mm-hmm. see that a lot with the women that you see? Absolutely. Again, lack of confidence, as we spoke about, self-consciousness, all well. Mm-hmm. These are all interconnected, isn't it? Because we need to integrate... You know, we are multifaceted creatures, but we expect to do so much. Mm, Exactly. All of us have so many hats to wear. Even at work, we have so many hats to wear, right? And then you go home, you have so many hats to wear. You go out, you have so many hats to wear. You you think of so many different things that we have to do. So that, then we need to sort of break it down and make everything sort of work. It's what I call is like your spine. We just need to have this grounding in us. So we feel grounded and we feel... Yes, I can, I can take care of me and I can take care of me. And then everything else that hits you, you, you can deal with. And I guess that's how the meditation that you, that you do works as well. It just sort of helps to stabilize the mind so that whatever menopausal symptoms come up, we can deal with them a bit better. Absolutely. Because menopause is a fact. It's a fact of love. You can't just say it doesn't exist. Mm, you can't exactly. sort of cuckoo work. Right? <laughs> we have to accept this is who I am and this is happening to me. What do I do next? Mm. But, you know, like we spoke earlier, it's overwhelming to go. And then also some of us can get self-conscious and we don't know, can I afford it? Can I not afford it? Do I need it? Do I not need it? Do I have the time? Do I have the time? Will this, should I tell this person? Should I not tell this person? You know, it's never all, just a simple decision. There are so many extra little things, it? things that we come as have results. so many things. We make a smoothie of our lives. You know, we just, <laughs> just put everything in and we, we, we actually make it. Yeah. So I just try to simplify things. Mm. and then go at each thing and more than anything else I'd like to empower the person so the thing is they go away knowing I am and I tell them to fill in the blank mm. like who are you and they need to say I am xyz so so that's the most and that must be an amazing discovery oh, to make gorgeous. actually when you've sort of forgotten what your sense of self oh, even is by it's that just, point it's just glorious tell <laughs> us a bit about i found this really interesting the soul cards that you do because they they very much sort of help the the client to understand the person who they are but also the person what was it that they that they could be for the rest of or, or the person they're meant to be for the Has rest of the world about soul cards yeah anybody it's yeah. so interesting it's not yet okay i studied this with the 
American Indian <laughs> real with a feather, those people. It's so cool. So soul cards, I, I've converted them to soul cards. Soul cards is nothing more. We human beings have many facets to us, right? I think we are unique. We are gorgeously unique. So we think, we are thinking as one. And if you do a meditation, which I'm not sure how many of you practice meditation or mindfulness, you realize you're not, you're actually listening to yourself. You talk to yourself. I don't know if you'll notice this to yourself. Who's telling you you're fat, you're thin, that color doesn't suit you? It's not you. It's somebody else judging you, right? So there's two of us. monkey mind. It's your monkey, but there's two of us already. Mm. Yes. But then there's also somebody else out there who says, no, that's not true. You're quite okay. Yeah. So there's many sides to us. So... People who sometimes feel, I don't know why, but I get drawn to go to the States. I get drawn to go to Japan. I get drawn to this person. Love at first sight. Mm. How does that happen? You know, we, we, we say that. If anybody's fallen in love at the first sight, they say, I don't know. My knees just went funny when I saw this guy. <laughs> right? So true. So that I call is a soul. Or sometimes we like certain foods and we don't even know. I never even knew I would like never tasted it you taste it so I call that our inner being every one of us is born with something which is extremely our DNA yes okay and that I call the soul so when that soul and what you work with are at two different levels then we get stress because they're they're in conflict with one another they're not doing something together so this is what happens. So I might think, oh, I need to be a mind, body, soul practitioner. I want to do this because it's an in thing. Or it's pretty cool to do this right now. <laughs> okay. But really, I'm a good mathematician. Probably I should be in the back or something on those lines. Um, and I try to do this. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't even think. I mean, she's calling me. She's so annoying. So we something doesn't match inside of us. So that's what soul card does. It tells us, you know, actually, for you... Your soul is resonating with this. How many of you, I just want to raise up hands to say, I felt at home in this place. I just felt so right. Has anybody ever felt that? Mm. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Yeah. And then are there places that you've been saying, I know everything was perfect, but I didn't feel right. Has anybody felt mm. that too? Yeah. 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 So that's what I mean. That's the soul in you. I'm using the word soul. It could be spirit. It could be a personality. It could be something which is not tangible. Yes. But you go to a doctor, they'll say that's nonsense. But even the doctor, I'm one too, but in a different language, but even the doctor will not be able to say, oh, I don't love my son. Because feelings are the most powerful things in the world. That's so true. The most powerful, right? There is no medicine for feelings as such. So the soul is our feelings of what I use. Is that even making sense so far? So the soul cards, which actually say, for example, if I do... X person, like I said, if I do Padma, I'm like, Padma, your soul wants you to do work with people and then bring a smile on their face. It's nice actually just to distill it to that yeah, something that just, simple. It's a when simple. When you think of how much else is going on in our heads. But then it's not as simple to do it. So you That's work so true. different. But soul cards even can bring you emotions, expressions, colors. It tells you a lot of things about you. Yes. So then that is so e- wonderful because you can take it away and you can use it in your life to say, if I have two job options, which one do I take? Then you can say, ah, I have two options. I can, might as well take this. Ah, oh, this is amazing. Can you do soul cards for me after this? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of, yeah. So that's what soul cards are. Soul cards are nothing more. I mean, I say nothing more. It's not that way. We are all born with magical qualities. Every one of us has a magical quality. All we need to do is tap into it. Yeah. We have forgotten it. So we right. have forgotten how smart we are. How intelligent our body is. I'm going like so passionate about this, as you can see. But it's true. You know, we just say, I thought he was lousy, but I still dated him for a few years. But you said that the first date was went wrong. I know, but I just stayed in. But like, sometimes we, we date us into ourselves. Do we, don't we do that? I mean, some of us do that. We hang in there thinking he's going to change or she's going to change. And you come out of it all beaten up, you know. But I, I would so much rather listen to you tell me what my magical quality is than try and figure it out for myself. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So these kind of, what soul card does is resonate with you. Yeah. Resonate with the person and then says to you, this is your quality. Mm-hmm. This is what you should be attracted to or this is what you should be interested in. And again, 
our life changes, like menopause, our life changes, mm. we can change with it. So it yeah, doesn't exactly. mean one size fits all at all times. You know, this trouser will fit me today, but it might not fit me two years from now. <laughs> right? So, so we, could, yeah, we evolve as human beings, the beautiful quality we have as we evolve. And, it, and it's amazing as well, because it sounds like it gives you a bit of a blueprint that you can, yeah, it if is you then do stray from the path where you get a bit sort of lost yeah. along the way, you've got something that you can anchor yourself to. Yeah. And even soul cards, again, going back to saying, how do I know what to treat people with? The soul cards could also say, you actually, you say to me, you don't believe in spiritual nonsense, but you really are. You, you do get attracted to energy. Mm. Or you might say, you say you're spiritual, but actually you're not. You like everything chop, chop, cut and dry, you're more scientific. Or, it doesn't matter what it is. It really helps you move there. Agreed. And um, and finally, you're you're a huge sort of fan of, of Ayurveda. You use it a lot in your practice, don't you? And, and that must be a really powerful tool to help menopausal women as well manage those physical, those emotional symptoms. What, what do you find yourself sort of mainly um, prescribing or, or recommending in terms of Ayurveda? Okay, I was brought up on Ayurveda for, for mm. 2000 years. That's what my family uh, doesn't know and mantras and everything else. So Ayurveda, again, is not one size does not fit all at mm. all. You have to see the whole person where they are at that moment in time. So you can't just say ashwagandha for everybody. It doesn't work like that. So yes, but how much as well is important. Mm, the dosage, exactly so, the same way as these ladies yeah. use the bioidentical hormones. Yeah. But then again, you, I would look at the diet mm -hmm. the, because each person's body is different. We all are different. So different body shapes, different body types need different kind of food mm -hmm. and percentages. So you know, somebody would need more protein, somebody would need more carbs, or somebody would need more sweets. Somebody was, can you imagine liking telling somebody to have more sweets? But it's <laughs> true. <laughs> I love so that. It's, uh, yeah, it's a different people. And again, at different stages, it changes with Ayurveda. Mm. So it could be the first two weeks you eat this, and then you go into a stabilizing and then away. So if you ask me what is the one I would suggest, I really can't. But I could suggest few things which are the same, like ashwagandha would help everybody. There's two or three other ones, which is brain related. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, another one which is taken the world by storm, including Chanel using their lipstick, is Murunga. It's become massive. Mm -hmm. Yes, you see Murunga in a lot of things. Yeah. Now, what, what does that, ha what, what uh, effect does that have? Murunga actually retains uh, moisture. Uh -huh. So it can go into the vagina, mm -hmm. so all the different Murunga is like really good. And it also is extremely good for gut. It's extremely good for immune system. It's, it's good for many, many, many. It's good for many things. But mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different kind of herbs and vit I call them vitamin herbs for different people at different stages mm -hmm. of the work they need. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and what about the sleeplessness at night? Is there anything that you can oh, ever yeah, recommend? Definitely. There's a, there's a meditation called a Yoga Nidra. I don't know if anybody's heard no, of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So again, in Yoga Nidra, I would again suggest what they eat before that, how they think. For me, it's all about thought process. Thought process, thought process, thought process. Change your thought process. Trust me, everything will just beautifully fall into place. Mm. So we need to keep working on it. You know, we wash ourselves every day. Physical hygiene, we need to do mental hygiene. We don't. Mm. How Clear many of us literally tip the bin off our head and say, okay, I've forgotten today. We don't. We see somebody 25 years later and say, I remember she was awful to me in that restaurant. And she <laughs> it's true, <laughs> right? We do. Well, you've got to tip it off. Just tip it off. It's gone. You're so right. So that is junk that you're carrying. I mean, you don't walk around with 25-year-old food rubbish. You, you throw it in the bin. This is the same. Please throw your junk. That's all junk. So mental hygiene is super key for physical mm -hmm. health as well. What happens to the mind happens to the body. What happens to the body happens to the mind, but really keep your mind clean and things will be fantastic. <laughs> it's all interconnected, isn't it? That's amazing. Thank you so much, Padna. Really, really interesting to hear your thoughts as well. And I'm definitely hitting you up for the soul cards. Um, that brings us to the end of tonight's conversation. And I must just say from my perspective, it's been so wonderful to sit here and listen to you all speak so candidly about all of these changes that happen in the menopause. Um, and it also strikes me that I suspect a lot of the women that do come to your doors find such a sense of relief in, in having been able to explore the options with you, find the solutions, but also a sense of sort of camaraderie and being able to speak to another woman about it, which I think is really powerful and, and can't be underestimated. Um, you know, the, the conversation about menopause is certainly getting louder. I do think it still has some way to go, but hopefully with more conversations like this and sort of more public forums, it can be something that we start to reframe, we start to even celebrate this stage and, and we sort of get that 
knowledge and that sort of sense of power back. Um, and I think hopefully that will keep us all in the safe and well into, into the future. Um, a huge thank you to our amazing beauty triangle. They've just been in so many ways insightful and wise and empowering. So thank you to all of you.